Hi, I'm Siobhan McCusker, the museum educator for university audiences at the Blanton Museum of Art at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome to our series, Curated Conversations. Today, we're delighted to welcome author Sarah Bird to talk about her new book, Last Dance on the Starlight Pier, and its connection to one of the most beloved paintings in our collection, Dance Marathon by Philip Evergood. Just a few notes before we begin. Your audio is muted so no one can hear you and only the panelists are visible on the screen. Closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking your questions from the Q&A window, um, so please have them coming throughout the presentation. Just click the icon below to type and send your questions and feel free to make comments in the chat window. Um, but please, we do ask that your questions come through the Q&A box so that we can moderate them. And today's event is being recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube page about one week from today. So let's get started. Um, called the finest living writer in Texas by the Texas Observer, Sarah Bird is a best-selling novelist, screenwriter, essayist, and journalist. She has published 11 novels and three books of essays. She's been an NPR Moth Radio Hour storyteller, a nine-time winner of Austin Best Fiction Award, a finalist for the Dublin International Literary Award, an Alex Award winner, an Amazon Literature Best of the Year selection, a Barnes and Noble's Discover Great Writers selection, a New York Public Library's Books to Remember, and an honoree of the Texas Writers Hall of Fame. Sarah has written for O Magazine, the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and Salon, among others, and was a columnist for Texas Monthly for six years. A 10-year career as a screenwriter when she wrote for such companies as Warner Brothers and Paramount led to her selection for the Meryl Streep Screenwriters Lab in 2015. Sarah co-founded the Writers League of Texas. And speaking of, we heard that there are some folks in the audience from the Writers League of Texas Summer Writing Retreat. I'm welcome and thanks for being here. Sarah is also the 2021 winner of the University of New Mexico's Paul Ray Award for Cultural Advocacy and is the hologram greeter at Austin Central Library. Um, welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to hand it over to you now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Siobhan. Uh, and I know what everybody out there is thinking after that endless resume is like, oh my gosh. Could she really be that old? She looks so young. <laughs> or perhaps you're not thinking that. Uh, it is a thrill to be here. And I, I'm, I'm going to start showing some images in a little while um, to talk about my connection with this novel and uh, the uh, immortal painting at the, uh, at the Blanton, as Siobhan mentioned, Philip Evergood's Dance Marathon. Um, let me also add my welcome to everybody. And I think I might as well start, I, I might as, I'd like to show this painting that, that is kind of the genesis of everything. So I will uh, begin doing that. Let's see. All right, so this is the painting in question, Philip Evergood's Dance Marathon. And uh, I'd just like to say with this painting in mind that this conversation is a dream come true for me. And this dream started many, many years ago when I had the extreme good fortune of standing in front of this exact painting in the Blanton Museum. Uh, in a moment, I'll tell you about my preceding lifelong interest in the dance marathons of the Great Depression. But really that moment of standing in front of this painting was what lit the fuse for what would eventually become my 11th novel, Last Dance on the Starlight Pier. 
I'm so very, very grateful to the Blanton, to Justin Siobhan for allowing me to be with you here today and, and to share some of the images and the research that inspired the book. My hope is that they will make the reading experience a little bit richer for you. Uh, when we're done, of course, I would love to answer questions and talk about whatever you all wanna talk about. But let's go back to the inspiration, the spark that ignited my interest in the dance marathons. My mother, Callista Marie McKay, that's her in the middle of this group portraying the Statue of Liberty. This photo was taken at the height of the Great Depression, just a few months before her father, a farmer on a struggling Indiana farm, died of a massive heart attack, leaving behind a wife and four children. Collie Mack, as we, her six sassy children like to call her, taught us by example that there is fun and laughter to be had in even the hardest of hard times if we can find a way to come together and share our troubles. I heard the echoes of those hard won laughs in the story she told of the time that her isolated rural community sponsored a dance marathon at the local Grange Hall. In my mother's recollection, that dance marathon had been a jolly community affair, sort of like a cross between a church supper and a slumber party, where for just a nickel admission, they could stay as long as they wanted. They could even stay up all night and watch the amazing sight of competitors who not only slept on their feet like horses, but kept moving the entire time. That rosy vision was at considerable odds with the unrelievedly grim version of dance marathons that I encountered in the 1969 movie, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? For years, decades, the suspicion nagged at me that this film did not tell quite the whole story. Very early on in my research, I learned that the movie was based on a novel by an author who had set out specifically to write the first American existential novel. You know, existentialism, Camus, Sartre, that whole laugh a minute, jolly gang. The more I read, however, the more certain I became that there was indeed a great deal more to this story than Hollywood had led us to believe. Early on in my research, I learned that the major element that this film about the dance marathons of the Great Depression had left out was indeed the Great Depression. That absence skewed the public's perception of these contests because it's impossible to understand the marathons and their popularity without appreciating how truly dire the times were. In 1933, the worst year of the worst economic disaster in not just America, but in the history of the industrialized world, one quarter of the nation's workers had lost their jobs. Those lucky enough to still be employed saw their salaries cut almost in half. Dust storms that turned the day to night were burying the Great Plains from Canada to Texas. Faced with this disaster, families split up or migrated from their homes in search of work. Some families simply couldn't afford to feed all their children and had to put the older ones out to make their way as best they could. Like these two teenagers here hopping a train. This then was the world that gave birth to the true dance marathons. The key element in their creation was time. In the novel, my protagonist, Evie Grace Devlin, a former vaudeville child star who turns to the marathon to survive, observes that, quote, the depression took away jobs and money. Too often, it took away drive and hope, and all it gave back was time. Oceans and oceans 
of endless time, time enough to care about a bunch of strangers who could almost feel like family if you watch them orbit a dance floor long enough. Given that these shows have virtually disappeared from our collective memory, I was astonished to discover just how wildly popular they had once been. At their height from roughly 1930 to 1934, countless small towns, as well as every city in the country with a population of 50,000 or more, hosted at least one show in venues that range from, say, a Grange Hall in rural Indiana, to auditoriums, coliseums, immense dance halls like the Roseland, and even arenas such as Madison Square Garden, where over 5,000 specters bought ticket for a show held there. In the peak years, marathons employed approximately 20,000 promoters, MCs, judges, trainers, nurses, contestants, and quote, sloppers who kept everyone fed. By way of comparison, the worldwide wrestling enterprise currently has fewer than 1,000 employees around the globe. But even more amazing than how popular the marathons were was how long they lasted. The couple that ultimately won the competition pictured here danced an astonishing 3,780 hours. That's more than five months. And what about sleep, you might ask? Well, every hour, the contestants got a 10 to 15 minute break. During that time, nurses and trainers attended to their aches and pains, their bunions and corns. There might be a time for a quick shower. The lucky ones slept. Because when they were on the floor, the contestants had to remain in constant motion, whether they were eating at chest high tables or attempting to shave or sleeping. Since the only real sleeping was done on the floor during the wee hours when the lights were low and the crowds were thin. Research for this novel was studded with great discoveries. But the one that practically made me shriek with joy was when I came across this photo. This photo accompanied a newspaper article reporting on the quote, colossal success of the opening night of a dance marathon that had attracted quote, 2000 spectators who had crowded into the city auditorium despite the heavy rains. That marathon had opened on September 12, 1932 in Galveston, Texas. This discovery thrilled me because Galveston, Texas in the 30s is a complete and utter gift to a novelist. I mean, we had our very own boardwalk empire down here in Texas, except that the weather was better and the people were nicer. Galveston back then was possessed of a dark glamor that had been created and was carefully cultivated by a pair of barber brothers, Sam and Rosario Maceo, who had emigrated from, yes, Sicily. And here the brothers are, Sam and Rose, just chilling with their pal, their paisan, Frank, Sinatra. The Maceo brothers transformed the city on a sandbar into an international destination for world-class entertainment that was so successful, it remained virtually immune to both the dry days of prohibition and the economic ravages of the Great Depression. <clears throat> As I had Evie Grace observe in the novel, Galveston was a wide open town where prohibition was a suggestion instead of the law of the land, where gambling wasn't considered any worse than chewing tobacco, and there were more prostitutes than spotted dogs. Most important, 
everyone knew that the only rules that applied in Galveston were the ones enforced by the family that ran the whole glorious empire of vice. The Maceo brothers specialized in swank, high dollar gambling, top shelf booze, and world-class entertainers. Duke Ellington, Phil Harris, Jimmy Dorsey, Peggy Lee, the Maceos booked them all into their ritzy clubs. Though the Balinese room seen here became the most famous of their locations, it wasn't built until after the Great Depression. The club that I featured in the novel's final scene was Galveston's first big time night spot, Hollywood Dinner Club, opened in 1926. The casino, decorated like something out of Scheherazade, seated 500 diners and was the first in the country to be air conditioned. Thanks to the Maceos, seen here with their pals, the sheriff and a constable, <clears throat> and their cozy relationships with law enforcement, Galveston had an abundance of glamorous, novel-ready settings. <clears throat> the one I chose for the setting of the novel's climactic dance marathon was the Pleasure Pier. In a definite instance of gilding the lily, I renamed the Pleasure Pier, Pier the Starlight Pier. Another research find that thrilled me was a memoir by the actress June Havoc. June was the daughter of a stage mother so notorious that the Broadway hit Gypsy was based on her. June's sister was the infamous dancer, burlesque dancer, Gypsy Rose Lee. Practically as soon as baby June could walk, their mother had the toddler toe dancing across vaudeville stages under the stage name, the pint-sized Pavlova. By the time June was 14, however, both vaudeville and her career were over. When June's mother saw her dreams of vicarious stardom dashed, she turned her daughter out to survive on her own. Like most contestants, June began entering marathons so that she'd have a roof over her head and plentiful food since competitors were fed a dozen times a day. Contestants were also lured by the possibility of winning cash prizes that ranged from a few hundred to a couple thousand dollars. Many sought stardom, and a few, like June Havoc, the comic Red Skelton, and the jazz singer Anita O'Day, even found it. Using memoirs such as June Havoc's, newspaper articles, journal articles, dissertations, letters, photo and radio archives, even cookbooks, movie fan magazines, and the Cherry Ames student nurse books, I began to recreate the anthropology of the lost world of the dance marathons. I was fascinated by how promoters had paved the way for everything from professional wrestling to reality television shows like The Bachelor by cooking up rivalries and romances between the contestants, by creating heroes for audiences to cheer and villains for them to boo. And then there were the special events that promoters staged to boost attendance. They would, yes, literally freeze favorite contestants alive, encasing them in huge blocks of ice until many were near death. They would take away rest periods and conduct sudden eliminations called grinds in which contestants had to sprint around the floor or drag iron balls shackled to their ankle or ankles or dance in crazy patterns. There were wildly popular grocery nights where huge crowds would thrill to the simple sight of seeing lucky winners take home baskets of food. And cot nights where audiences thrilled to the even simpler sight of watching contestants sleep. Since the marriage rate during the depression 
was down by a third because couples couldn't afford to start their lives together, fancy weddings of any sort were a huge attraction. But a cellophane wedding where the bride and all her many bridesmaids wore gowns made of transparent cellophane over their underwear? Well, that was a guaranteed sold out house. The cellophane wedding was another one of the fabulous research discoveries that ended up becoming a pivotal element in my novel. But the main event of the shows was simply watching how long the contestants could endure and waiting for those dramatic moments when someone would drop from sheer exhaustion. As thrilling as the eliminations were, however, there had to be winners. There had to be two ordinary people who were not too different from themselves that an audience could cheer for. The point of the competitions was spectators seeing fighters who struggled against the odds just like they were struggling. These, those desperate audiences needed the reassurance of seeing a gus, gutsy couple who endured it all and who managed to triumph over the sheer endless grind. They needed the little spark of hope it gave them that they too were going to not just endure the sheer endless grind of a depression, but maybe even come out winners themselves in the end. I'm so grateful to my mother for sparking my interest in dance marathons. It was a strange sort of gift from her that I was working on this novel during the early days of the pandemic, when we were all locked down and sanitizing our groceries and uncertain about just how bad things were going to get or how long it all was going to last. Though I by no means want to equate my hardship, having to quit my Pilates class with the deprivations that my mother's generation endured, I did find it inspiring to explore a world animated by the resilience of the American spirit, a world where if we would come together and share our troubles, a bit of fun, a few laughs, or at least some much needed distraction could be had in even the hardest of hard times. I'm also grateful for my very good luck in having access to Philip Evergood's astonishing depiction of a dance marathon. I'd like now to thank the Blanton for displaying this piece and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the world it captured and the novel it helped inspire. And thank all of you for joining us. I hope there's time for lots of questions now. Thank you, Sarah. That was so beautiful and illuminating. And um, I loved hearing some excerpts from your book and um, the myriad source materials were really fascinating to me and to um, members of the audience today. And we have a, a question um, from Linda and I'm gonna just um, jump right into this question. And um, Linda asks, what did you find in the Cherry Ames books? <laughs> Linda said she read those, um, but her uh, I young... Should, I should explain that my heroine was a nursing student. And uh, as my mother had been a nursing student. Um, and honestly, the chair, here we got Cherry right here. Here's Cherry, Cherry. Um, these are actually the best depiction I could find of what uh, nurses training was like in the 30s. So that they were valuable. They were very, very val valuable. I mean, uh, and I, I too had grown up reading them. So it was nice to revisit Cherry Ames. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And um, another connected question is, um, where did you do your research? So well, Jeanette. Uh, this was, you know, I mean, of the many fortuitous things, the timing was great in that I had completed all my in-person research by the time the world shut down. I had, um, I, I visited Galveston a lot. Um, and, you know, the university libraries are astonishing sources that uh, 
that I availed myself of. You know, just really, really, you could really dig in. You know, there are people writing, you know, thesis about odd, odd moments in in the Great Depression. So, so it was. I was fortunate that I had completed that by the time I started. And I will make one other comment about research is that this was a hard book to research and in this sense, and I think it ties into what we're saying today, in that these uh, events were, were not documented, like not remotely as extensively as I think they should have been given their popularity at the time. And I think that has to do with uh, the fact that they were by and large uh, blue collar entertainments. And, um, you know, perhaps we're not deemed worthy of being archived, collected. I was very, very fortunate that I had this, this book, um, this, this is the Rosetta Stone, because this wonderful author um, in the 90s wrote this, and she went out and, and contacted uh, people who had participated in the dance marathons and collected their, their photos, their memories, and it was, I mean, it was so fortunate because this was the 90s and, and, and not many of them lived much longer after that. So um, that was just so many sources. And, you know, obviously I read They Shoot Horses, Don't They? But, but it was, you know, my in-person research was finished by the time I, I sat down to write. And your photographs, there's many questions as to where you are um, finding these photographs. Was that particularly from that book that you mentioned? No, this, uh, photographs are also an interesting aspect of this in the sense that there really are quite a few photographs on the internet, but uh, finding out who owns them is virtually impossible. Um, and I really, really wanted to have at least a couple photos in, in my novel because again and again, there's almost this sense from people that they don't believe this really happened. And I really wanted at least a couple photos to, to really emphasize this happened. And so I purchased some of uh, photos that this author had, that this, you know, in the Rosetta Stone, I, I purchased a couple of photos from the reproduction rights from those, but if you want to, I mean, really, if just for your own interest, uh, not reproduction, there are lots and lots of incredible photographs on, and the ones I'm showing, I could not, I could not reproduce those, but I can use them in, in a presentation like this. Thanks, Sarah. And there's um, some other questions about your research, this seems to be a, a very intriguing component. Um, as, a, as, a, as an author, um, someone is asking, how did you select the name of the peer? And without being a plot spoiler, what research inspired your Zane character? Oh, uh, <laughs> I wonder. Yes, I think I know what, what plot you're talking about. Um, so, and I know everybody calls him Zane. His name is actually Zave because he's kind of masquerading as a Catholic uh, boy. And that was one of the elements in the book. Uh, my mother was a Methodist. She went to a, a Catholic training school and Catholics in the thirties, I mean, the Ku Klux Klan burnt crosses in front of Catholic houses. It, they were, had not been absorbed yet into American society. You know, they're called mackerel snappers. And the belief was that they all submitted themselves to the Pope and were going to rise up in the Pope's army. So um, by, you know, it was a very heavy identifier in those days to be Catholic. And Zave, as part of his, uh, the identity he created, he created, uh, he named himself after St. Xavier and his name was Zave. Everybody called him Zave. Uh, and how did I create Zave? What did, I created Zay through, um, you know, of the, of the memoirs I read, you know, there, there were characters like a little bit like Zabe. And honestly, as my heroine and Zabe came together and I understood ultimately what she needed in life and, and who he was, um, his identity kind of grew out of that. I, as you mentioned, I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but thank you. 
Sarah, we're having so many questions here, and I'm, I'm I'm wanting to make sure I honor all of them. So there was just the one kind of oh, connected, <laughs> um, connected question to the decision to um, rename the the pair, the Starlight pair, and what was that inspiration? That is because um, you know I used physical reality of the pleasure pier, which was a huge thing built in, in Galveston for a million and a half dollars, as they bragged in those days. Uh, but the chronology didn't quite fit my story. And so I took the pleasure pier and I renamed it the Starlight Pier, hopefully not to annoy um, the Galveston Piers, of which there are a lot. Well, you know, I, I, thought, I thought Austin was a city that was in love with itself, but stand back. Nobody comes close to Galvestonians in their love of their city. And, uh, you know, if there are any Galvestonians listening, just hail to the BOIs. And if you don't know what that means, then sorry, <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> so that's the reason. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And then there's um, another question. We are going to get to the art component, the painting component, yes. but I want to just definitely honor those um um, audience members who are really interested in writing um, and the research. And so an anonymous attendee has said, are there any tips for writers struggling to balance research with a oh, fictional story? Very, 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 very excellent question, uh, particularly with historical fiction. And I've you know, frequently learned the hard way not to fall in love with my research. And um, it's, it's kind of a dance you do in which you do enough research to know the world, you know, and, and then, you know, at that point, I mean, I would advise somebody attempting to do this at that point, And I, I say this because I've made this, I've done this the wrong way. So I'm going to tell you the right way to do it. Uh, know the world and then really know your characters, know who your characters are, what their story is. Um, and then go back and, and, fill in with what you need to fill in for their story. You know, what they need to be seeing at that moment, what they need to be hearing, what would be in the newspaper at that point. Um, I mean, I, I could tell you the way I've done it wrong. You don't want to do it that way. I mean, and it, it, it does have to do with falling in love with your research, going down rabbit holes, you know, tons of fun, really wonderful but most important to know your characters, what their story is, what their story is going to demand of the world that you create for them. So short answer. I could give you a longer answer if you want to get in touch with me. Thank you, Sarah. And then um, this is a wonderful question. Has anyone acquired movie rights to any of your <laughs> That is a wonderful question. <laughs> All authors love that question. The answer is no. Uh, it's very hard to get you know, anything done, but especially if it's period, period is quite expensive. Um, I mean, I, perhaps I'm a little biased. I think it'd make a wonderful movie. I would, I would love to, I would love to see it on the screen. And I, you know, I would certainly love it as, as a, a kind of an antidote to They Shoot Horses, you know, the existential version of uh, uh, the dance marathons. Um, thank you. If anybody has any connections out there, let me know. Um, and let me see some other questions. Was Galveston historically able to escape some of the Depression era hardships? Absolutely, 100%. 100, it was a world, I mean, exactly as I described. Uh, Galveston floated on a, a sea of uh, bootleg liquor throughout, the, throughout Prohibition and, and that floated on just this giant cushion of money uh, brought in by the Maceos who turned Galveston into a world-class destination for entertainment. Absolutely true. Um, you know, <clears throat> which is, like I said, that was, that was one of the great, great research. So I, I knew about Galveston. I knew about, <clears throat> you know, how glamorous it was in the thirties. Uh, so it was a thrill then to find the photograph I showed you all that I was able to legitimately use that as a setting for a, a dance marathon. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and then there's a, a really interesting question about the aftermath of the Galveston hurricane. And was it apparent in the 1930s? So uh, the Galveston hurricane, still the greatest natural disaster in America, uh, occurred in 1900. 
and uh, flatten what is essentially a sandbar island. You know, uh, there were some, some buildings left standing, but most, you know, much of it was scraped away. And I think it just is kind of thrilling to me and a testament to the very specific, wonderful nature of Galvestonians is that here they are on a sandbar island <laughs> and, and they come back, you know, and it's all gone after this giant hurricane, which, you know, it's not gonna be the last hurricane. And they look around and, and do they think, hmm, how about if rather than sand, we build this city on hmm, perhaps granite inland somewhere? No, <laughs> no. Their response to that was, let's jack the city up 17 feet and put a seawall around it. And that's what they did. That's what happened. And Galveston at the time, you, you should know, was, was the leading, it was far ahead of Houston in terms of importance for a shipping center and you know, uh, the big economic power in Texas at that time. A lot of money, many fortunes had been made. If you go to Galveston now, you see unbelievable turn of the century mansions built and it, it was known as the Ellis Island of the West because so many immigrants came through um, LSI uh, came through Galveston, but fortunes were made, gigantic fortunes were made. They rebuilt the city, what I'm saying, after the 1900 hurricane. And it was, um, you know, by the 20s, even the late teens, it was, it was the place to go to have a good time, you know, to drink illegal booze. And, and uh, it definitely, you know, had, had fully recovered. So, um, you know, and subsequently there were subsequent hurricanes that, for example, uh, took out the Pleasure Pier that I that I modeled the uh, Starlight Pier on. But uh, certainly by that point, there there was no not not from the 19. There were there were later hurricanes that there was might have been evidence of, but no. Thank you, Sarah. I'm um, having this like rich history of place is um, really fascinating and. Um, there's a, a very curious question, and it's one that I often think about when I teach with Dance Marathon with um, university students. And um, Lynn is asking if there is a direct lineage from Dance Marathons to reality TV shows like Survivor and The Bachelor. Uh, yes, clearly. Yeah, yeah, I, I see complete, uh, you know, it, they established the template, you know, with uh, promoters, uh, cooking up, as I said, the rivalries and the romances and, and, and the heroes and villains, so that there was an ongoing narrative throughout these extremely long shows that to keep the audience interest, you know, and they, they, they had somebody to cheer for, they had somebody to boo for, they would designate some, and I, you know, I have this worked out in my book, you know, somebody would be designated the, the uh, dark haired vamp, and then there'd be the blonde sweet girl, um, but yeah, it, it, it was exactly that. It, you can see that in, in, in any of, of the uh, reality shows in which, you know, you learn, you get the, the character story, you get not the character, but the, the, the contestant's story and become invested in the way these audiences were invested in, in this reality show that took place in front of them. You know, they're watching them eat, they watched them sleep, they, you know, watched them shave, watched them get married. So, you know, fully invested in their lives in, in the way that um, that reality television did subsequently. There's um, another question that, that is coming up in kind of from multiple angles, but did you find dance marathons that were specifically um, open to African-American participants or participants? This is... Uh, uh, Siobhan, this is a great question, which I was, I, you know, at some point would like to ask you about the painting, um, mm -hmm. is that uh, this was a rigorously segregated time in our country. And I mean, rigorously. There were certainly not going to be people of color in dance marathons. That, I, you know, probably illegal in many states. So um, what I will say is that the dance marathons, held in Galveston were famous because they had Latino competitors. I don't know of any, any uh, African-American competitors, but absolutely, they had a contingent from the Valley that came to, uh, to the show I, I uh, displayed the picture of and several others 
and they were held. There were lots of shows held throughout Texas. And in reports about these shows, the Latino uh, participants would have big cheering sections and in various you know, hometown people. With. So, so I don't have any photographs uh, to show that, but it's, you know, in what record there is, that is recorded. But I, um, certainly as far as black participants, I, I, I never a hint of it. Thank you, Sarah. Is it possible for us to look, um, to bring up the slide with Dance Marathon again, so we can just answer some of those questions with the painting? I think absolutely, yes. Thank you. That's wonderful. We have this um, question from Alison, and um, Alison was interested in your broad interpretation and opinions about Evergood's painting. Um, thinking about the haunting composition and the exhausted figures and kind of reaching for the skeletal hand. And how does this complicated depiction of the marathons align with some of your own feelings or your mother's or other historical accounts about the craze? Great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is what we want to talk about. Um, so I, uh, to me, this depiction is it shows kind of, uh, you know, the received wisdom about what dance marathons were. And I, I see a couple ways of interpreting it. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a lot of exploitation going on. And so I, I you know, I'm trying to get into ever, and I would love Siobhan's thoughts about this. I'm trying to get into Evergood's head. Is he, I mean, who does he identify as the culprit here? the promoters of the show and see, look, the, the, as Siobhan mentioned, the skeletal hand coming up here with the dollar bill seems to be reaching in from above. And I think Evergood, just from what little I know, and, and Siobhan, please tell me more, um, was a social activist and was aware this time of the kind of hands off economic policy, certainly of, of Hoover's administration. Roosevelt was trying to correct that but uh, I think his comment is about, you know, what we would now point to as our villains, the billionaires and, and the industrial society and, and the exploitation of workers. Uh, because, yeah, and my, you know, so my feelings, I have, you know, a little bit of a conflict coming, you know, from my mothers uh, talking about what jolly fun they were. And, and, you know, none of these participants seem to really be having that much jolly fun. So I think uh, my interpret ever, ever good was, was talking about other things. And um, this is also interesting to me that it's a walkathon. And this was done in response. They changed the name from the dance marathons to walkathons uh, sometime in the, pretty early on in the 30s because of so many protests and from ladies like ladies morality leagues churches and whatnot and you know baptists who could not sanction the thought of, of dancing happening in their in their vicinity so that it was changed to walkathon but a lot of a lot of the outrage about dance marathons was orchestrated by theater owners who did not like the competition of these months long events, pulling customers away from, away from their theaters. So they kind of ganged up, I mean, not gang up, but they, these, two, these two impulses fed each other to create the narrative that, that, they, that they were appalling and lurid and, and, um, and exploitative. And I am certainly not gonna say they were not grueling. They were very, very, very grueling, but as I, tried to point out in the presentation, it's so important to consider the context in which people were scrambling to eat. You know, there were a lot of, a lot of uh, young people who joined the marathons had been kicked out by their family, you know, were riding the rails and, you know, looking for their next meal. They didn't have safe places to stay. And as June Havoc writes in her memoir, and she was she was essentially one of these children. You know, she started doing it at fourteen. She had nowhere to go, uh, and she said, "You know, they became they became a family, and it gave them hope. It gave their 
lives. And I, I think about, you know, how kind of formless our lives became during the pandemic. And I think about the depression, people are out of work, they're just drifting. You know, the depression lasted for almost 10 years. And so, you know, another potential benefit of the dance marathons was they would they gave focus to lives and they gave hope. Possibly you could be the one to win. So uh, yeah, I love this painting in that it brings so many of these issues out. And I, I also just love it because it's such a great, I mean, it's the best depiction of, of a dance marathon there is given the state of photography at that time. Shavana. Thanks, Sarah. I'm, I'm gonna interject quickly with just um, a little quote from Philip Evergood. He, um, he says that he, he was interested in putting down the ugliness as well as the pretty, a deep search for the character of people. He felt that a social artist must depict reality in a manner which makes people think and wonder and search until they find it for themselves. He painted, he said he painted with a somewhat new imaginative, imaginative viewpoint, perhaps as fresh and original in its little way as was Toulouse-Lautrec's approach to the palace uh, boulevard crowds and the Moulin Rouge dances of his day. He says, I've never been interested in seeing things with a photographic realist's eye. And I think that's what makes this painting so extraordinarily magical is yeah. that he's combining definitely reference to real photographic imagery that he would have had access to um, in the time of making this work in, in 1934. But he allowed those photographic images to gestate and to kind of be infused with his um, fantastical imagination and imaginings and um, expression and allegory and symbol and so it's not it's not a it's not a real depiction in the sense of um how it would have actually unfolded in the 1930s it's this imagined reinterpretation both both i think of the exploitation but also of the um inclusion um of um looking at a world that was not segregated looking at a a, a world that was um inclusive of all um, races and, and um, experiences and expressions um, in the country. So I think when people are asking um, questions in the chat uh, on the questions, sorry, section about are they same gender dancers? I don't believe that there were um, dance marathons for um, same gendered um, couples I think this is just really his way of interpreting potentially um, a new reality a, a, a new um, experience but also thinking about how women were um, extraordinarily strong in this situation and men might have been more vulnerable and hopeless than um, could have been depicted in other paintings or poems or songs at the time. Um, and sorry, there was one other question. The painting is currently on display at the Blanton. Um, yeah, go check it out. It's a marvelous experience. Uh, that's fascinating, Siobhan. So, you, so to you, this painting is in a way aspirational more than mm -hmm. documentary. Yes, definitely um, critical of the exploitation and the hopelessness and the social injustice that was happening um, during the time. But it's also... I, think it's um, an imagining of, of the possibilities of a different type of um, lived experience. It's fantastic. You know, I mean, it just, it just is so powerful and, and leaves you with questions and, and curiosity and it certainly did for me. Just really galvanized all my interest in this world. I, I'm so grateful for the good fortune that I live in this city the Blanton has this and that you display it. So Absolutely. Who knows what else people might find there that will spark their wildest imaginings. Absolutely. And perhaps there's other novels waiting to be written with oh, inspiration yeah. from other works of art in our collection. Um, Justin, do you want to just tell me a, a quick time check? How are we doing here at this moment? Um, do we have time for another question or two? 
Absolutely. We have about five minutes. Fantastic. So we do have a question that's particular about um, some aspects of the painting. And I'm going to defer to you first, um, Sarah, about what do you think the Mickey Mouse is doing in the painting? <laughs> I actually, Siobhan, you have a, you have a thought about that. So I, <laughs> I have... I have no thought about that. I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, not having grown up in America and not having, um, you know, the, the deep love of this um, Walt Disney character that maybe many, many of our um, audience has, I sort of saw the character as both um, tapping into what Mickey Mouse represented by 1934. I think he was only created in 1928. So still quite a, a new character. And he was lovable and mischievous and heroic, but I also see a dark side to him. And I think by the 19, by 1934, there was um, a lot of merchandise associated with, with Mickey Mouse. And so I, I was sort of seeing the, the darker, um, corporate angle when I saw that little figure in the back, but that might just be my, you know, specific skewed perspective. What, what do you see, Sarah? Uh, well, you know, I mean, historically, Mickey Mouse kind of started as a pretty demonic looking character. So uh, it, it is funny. It is a funny conjunction, you know, that, that, that these dancers' lives are being ruled by a clock and this one is held up by a giant mouse rat. And so like, look, you're in the 49th day and here's Mickey going, yeah, dance on suckers. I, uh, it's interesting. I, I, you know, hail to Philip Evergood for the imagination to include that. Absolutely. I mean, and just like, if we think about, uh, you know, the extraordinary acid color, we think about, you know, the, the, um, androgynous nature of these dancers, if we're thinking about the distortion of their bodies, you know, Philip Evergood is referencing very, you know, there's very strong art historical references in, in this image, um, both uh, 16th and 17th century references of mannerist painting. He's also referencing some of his early um, experiences with printmaking. We can see the dark um, black outlines. Um, around some of his uh, kind of uh, body musculature. Um, he was an extraordinarily drafts person. So he knew how to draw with, you know, incredible skill. And so this is, this is a painting that is just pushing all those boundaries. He's taken his skill and his, um, you know, very clear um, understanding of, the world in which he was living and the social injustice that he was um, perceiving, definitely from a very privileged position. He was um, raised in England. He went to Eton and Cambridge, so had a you know very sheltered and privileged um, place um, in the world. But he was he was looking at New York in the 1930s and thinking about both what was so destructive and corrupt and dehumanizing, but also thinking about um, some possible imaginings for um, redemption, I think, in some ways. Any last, last thoughts before we close, I, Sarah? I would like to say anybody, if you have any further questions, you know, hit me up on, I have a website, Sarah Bird Books. Uh, be delighted to talk about this or anything else you want to talk about. This has just been quite astonishing. This really was a dream come true for me. And that's so just magical for me to think about standing, standing in front of this, this uh, painting and, and now having this conversation. So I'm really grateful to Siobhan, to Justin, to the Blanton, to all, all the patrons who make an experience like this possible. Thank you so much, Sarah. And um, I'm ho hoping that um, your fans are able to go and purchase your um, incredible book from Book People. Um, I think Justin is going to put the link 
in the chat. Um, and thank you so much for your time and um, your enthusiasm and your expertise in, in sharing your research um, with our audience and making connections to this really um, profound work of art in our collection. Um, and everyone who joined us, thank you so much for that. We hope you have um, enjoyed this uh, conversation with us today. And um, we invite you to come back again on September the 14th after a brief hiatus in August. And we're gonna delve into the long awaited exhibition, Painted Cloth, Fashion and Ritual in Colonial Latin America. And if you'd like to show support for the Blanton, um, let me give you some details of that. Um, become a member today at blantonmuseum.org slash membership or sign up for our Blanton News at blantonmuseum.org slash subscribe um, to always be in the know about what's happening at the museum. And um, we invite you to watch the entire curated conversation series at blantonmuseum.org slash curated conversations and learn more about volunteer opportunities at theblanton.org slash volunteer. Thank you again. Um, it was wonderful that we had so many join us today. And um, thank you, Sarah. It was such a gift to have this time with you. Um, I can see that people were so delighted um, to delve into this Texas history, but also to um, connect to, to a work of art that is really beloved in our collection. And Justin was telling me um, beforehand that the Dance Marathon postcard is her biggest seller in our oh, gift shop. Of course. <laughs> that makes sense. All right. I, uh, like I say, anybody wants to continue the conversation, hit me up. I would love it. Meanwhile, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.